evening. Welcome to this uh, Sunday afternoon study. It's Labor Day weekend. Hope many of you are enjoying uh, maybe some relaxing time. Uh, some are either out of school or off work or both uh, tomorrow. So I hope you enjoy that time. We had several visiting families at Hartsville Pike this morning from out of town and uh, that's always encouraging. So hope you have a great weekend even if you're not doing anything or seeing anyone else. Remember your prayers, Winfred Vaughn, who uh, had a fall in his shower yesterday, has a broken clavicle, collarbone, and uh, also some damage to his leg. They're still looking at some x-rays and determining uh, possibly no broken bone, but very, very severely bruised one in his hip. So uh, pray for that family with, uh, with Winfred's issues there. We have several in our church family with coronavirus, and that's not a, a welcome visitor at all, but uh, praying that uh, that will be Lyme cases for them, that uh, all of them will bounce back and be recovering soon. We had our church parking lot uh, resealed, and they'll be striping that this week. Uh, some of the classes that were going to start last week will be uh, postponed another one. We'll wait till uh, a week from this week, and hopefully all that will be will be finished there. Lena, good to see you. Uh, I hope you're having a, a good time with your family. I did post some questions just a few minutes ago, kind of to guide our discussion. I don't know if you had a chance to look at those on the website, our church website there. Well, not church website, but our, our Hartsville Pike uh, Facebook page. So I'll be thinking about those and letting those guide us. So uh, have your Bible open to Luke 2. Uh, we were cut off at after about 20 minutes, I think, uh, the last time, last Sunday night. So I hope our internet stays connected. I think I paid the bill this week, so we should be good to go that week. Uh, all right, let's get back to a familiar story in Luke 2. This is Jesus. There's been a fast forwarding from his birth until his time at 12 years old there. They've gone with the family to worship in Jerusalem, one of the three big feasts there. And so um, family leaves. There's an extended family. Uh, Jesus is not found. Perhaps each of the parents thought he was with the other and so they go back to Jerusalem. It's three days, the third day when that happens. Let's take up reading in verse 46. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening uh, to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. This is probably, I think we left off last time, indicating a, a time of awareness a time when typically young men would be kind of recognized as sons of the covenant. We think about even bar mitzvah ceremonies that have endured today to indicate not that um, a boy at 12 or 13 is a man, but uh, there again is, is kind of the, the awareness, kind of the transition. And so Jesus is different and unique, obviously. And I think it's uh, enticing that they are, they're impressed with his wisdom. There's something about this boy Incidentally, not raised in the rabbinic schools. There have been uh, ones like Paul later that talks about being raised at the feet of Gamaliel. Basically, a, a family turning their sons over to a respected rabbi. Jesus said had none of that. And that's not discounting Mary Joseph's teaching and influence. But uh, So they're, they're looking at his answers and his questions even. Maybe some of the most deep and penetrating questions they could have imagined. And so there is a, a shock. Uh, astonishment. That's an interesting word there. Now, one of the commentators I looked at asked and, and raised a good question. He said, do you think that people like Gamaliel or Nicodemus might have been present then? Some of the ones who would later uh, encounter Jesus in a couple of decades wonder if they were there and, and would have made the connection to who he was. Well, that's not spelled out in Scripture. We can only speculate about that, but it's kind of an interesting food for thought there. In verse 48 of Luke 2, so when they saw him, that's Joseph and Mary saw Jesus, it says they were, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? She's getting back to the idea that, you know what, these people may not realize that you've been left behind, but I do. Why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously your father. She's talking there about Joseph, not strictly his biological father, of course, but the one who is effectively his father. And it's very interesting. Do you know, you know, if you were asked on a trivia question, what were the first recorded words of Jesus? Where could you find them? Well, you know the answer. 
they're right where we're going to look here in verse 49. He said to them, by the way, not his first words, but the first recorded words. I suppose that something like a, a, a Greek version of mama or dada was probably his first words. But he says to her in response, why did you seek me? Why were you looking after me? By the way, I don't think that's uh, said in an ugly way, disrespectful tone at all. He goes on to say, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Some of the translations even render that a little bit differently. Some uh, would say something like, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? That uh, word translated business house, kind of, uh, kind of vague. It could be about my father's dealings or about my father's things. And so thinking about that, there's uh, an awareness on his part. Think about the, the lowercase father, Joseph, versus the uppercase father, God. Your father and I have sought you anxiously. We've been worried sick is how we would say it today. And Jesus says there's another father in the picture. And my being here in the temple regarding these holy things, these spiritual discussions, uh, he's saying again, I, I think as respectfully as he could, not in any way to diminish her role or their authority, I must be about my father's business or in my father's house, attending to my holy father, my creator God. And that's very interesting as we think about Jesus being part of the Godhead. He's still the father, not in the sense that he bore Jesus, but uh, so, so we have an advantage in thinking about Jesus in those terms. And so uh, how does Mary respond to that? It says in verse 50, they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And I don't know how many people heard that, whether that's just Mary and Joseph or others, maybe if the teachers of the law are still there. They're a little, uh, it goes over their head, we would say. But we do know what he's talking about and how that, uh, although he's not about to launch into his ministry at that point, there is an awareness there. And you see this summary verse, verses 51, 52, the last two in chapter two of Luke, where it says he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He went down, actually, that's not down going south. That's going down from upper elevation to lower elevation, actually north from uh, Jerusalem there. But he goes back to Nazareth, his hometown, and was subject to them. And so when you think about even reconciling the idea, I must be about my father's business, that may, didn't mean that he stayed in Jerusalem uh, from then on. But it uh, indicates, again, it is possible to honor God, the capital F, Father, and honor lowercase mothers and fathers and realize that uh, really there's, there's no incompatibility between them. In fact, it would shock us if we saw Jesus disrespecting parents while claiming allegiance to God. We would do our children the best service possible if we could say, you know what, uh, obedience and honor and respect certainly goes to God. In fact, he goes to him supremely. But it's not a matter of, well, you go ahead and, and honor God, disrespect me, and then that'll be fine. No, uh, but because God in his word says we're to honor our father and mother. That's part of the Old Testament law. It's embedded in the New Testament certainly as well. And so thankfully we can do both of those. But to me, the tragedy would be if a child or children are very respectful parents, never a crossword, never uh, any kind of dishonor, and yet didn't know God, or perhaps even worse, were to dishonor God. That wouldn't be uh, the best case scenario either, would it? Why? Because while honor for the parents is given, a dishonor for God is, uh, is not something that can be uh, explained away there. We owe our ultimate allegiance to the Creator, our Heavenly Father. All right, let's segue into Luke chapter 3. I think it's interesting how that chapter 3 begins. There's going to be a reference to several world leaders, several local leaders. There are religious leaders. And all this is, is going to make the transition, and we're going to fast forward here about 18 years. 18 years, we're going to see John the Baptist, who at that time was you know just six months older roughly than, than Jesus, we haven't seen him. We wonder, since all these uh, promises, even back to chapter 1, are uh, entailed there, uh, when's he going to make his appearance? Read with me. 
Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod uh, being tetrarch, that means a fourth part ruler of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Let's get to John in a moment. But there's an important historical marker, a reference given to us. If you look in secular history and even consult Bible uh, commentaries and things like that, these are people uh, that are mentioned prominently outside of the Bible. It's not mentioning someone, but well, we can only know they existed because uh, Luke's account there. No, in fact, they're going to appear several times in the context of the ministry of Jesus. You see them on the front end, you're going to see them on the back end. The Pilots and the Herods, the ones at the trial of Jesus, including Annas and, and Caiaphas or Caiaphas. And so just about three, three and a half years is going to bridge this beginning early in the gospel toward the end. But it's, uh, I think, maybe a, a way of saying, if you look at the broad picture, look at the world power, you've got uh, Tiberius Caesar, all of these, incidentally, you, you can kind of see them pointing toward the late 20s AD. Some would say around 28, 29 is, is what would correspond to our, our calendars. And again, uh, it's important to drive this peg home. When the Bible speaks chronologically when it talks about uh, historical eras, uh, understand E-R-A, not E-R-O-R-S. There are no errors. There are eras. Uh, eons or uh, references to time markers there, they dovetail beautifully. Uh, there's no way of having to, to twist them or, or force them into some kind of contrived thing at all. They, they fit there. And so I think it's almost saying, you know what, here are the world leaders. Here are the ones who are acknowledged, uh, maybe not admired by everyone, but uh, uh, accepted as, as these are the powers. Uh, on, on the broad scale there and coming down to even the local ones, and then it mentions the religious leaders. Annas was um, a high priest. He had actually been deposed. He's the father-in-law of Caiaphas. John's Gospel is going to bring that out in more detail in the later chapters there. But let me get to that. Annas served from about A.D. 6 or 7 to A.D. 15. Uh, it's not until A.D. 18 that Caiaphas, his son-in-law, takes the reins. He rules in about A.D. 36 or 37. And so Annas being the older, is still kind of looked at as as uh, the man behind uh, the seat of authority. It's almost like they're co-rulers, co-leaders. Co Might be some, someone maybe that's uh, founded a company and has been the CEO and he hands the reign over to his son or his son-in-law, but uh, he doesn't just retire. He, he's there. He's on side. He's, he's a policymaker and affects decisions, and so he may not be the the literal CEO, but people know he still wields a lot of power. That's how a similar thing with Annas and Caiaphas there. And so think about all these, again, political uh, rulers, uh, religious bigwigs, and then little old John the Baptist out in the wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere. And so thinking about those, uh, who's the best known? Well, it wouldn't have been John. In fact, uh, when you see the details given about him and what he's doing, most of the people, uh, certainly in that day and age, unless they lived in that region, would not have known who he was. Some of them uh, never met him. But let's see what God knows about him and his important role. He's out in the wilderness. It says he went into all the region around the Jordan, that's the river, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying. Now, one of the questions I ask you, and we'll get into uh, this baptism, how it was like, uh, the Great Commission, especially as it's time to repentance, how it's different in some ways. But the quotation, you may have a Bible that has um, some notes in the margin or center column references or something. It's in Isaiah chapter what? 40, verses 3 through 5. You look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see them, um, and I'm trying to remember if all four of them do. I think there is some illusion, uh, maybe all four, I know at least three reference this. 
the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This would have been, again, um, if this doesn't go word for word with your Isaiah chapter 40, this is from the Septuagint. It's a translation of the Hebrew and the Greek. And so the translation of their days, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain shall be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so God had willed that at just the right juncture in history, there would be the forerunner, there would be the proclaimer, the one who is preparing the way of God. And what is interesting to me is that he didn't plan him squarely in the temple precinct and have him uh, rubbing shoulders with the religious elite. No, it's it's almost as if God willed that he be as far removed from that which was was kind of nauseating God. You see, religion had devolved to that point in which it was just a mere shadow of itself. And so with all the pomp and all the hypocrisy, really, of, of the Jews, many of them, certainly Pharisees and Sadducees, each had their faults and flaws, God knew what he was doing in starting this revival, this ministry, out in the middle of nowhere out of the Jordan River there. Who was John? The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make, uh, make his path straight. Prepare the way. Every valley field. These are words of renovation. They are words of change. And indeed, a change needed to take place. And so it's a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Here's a little history going back uh, to the Old Testament was baptism, and we're talking about the, the actual word referring to a burial in water, a submerging something. Baptism never meant sprinkling, never meant pouring or partially uh, immersing someone or, or getting them wet. But uh, was baptism practiced in the Old Testament? Actually, for proselytes, and a proselyte was a convert from heathenism or from a Gentile background to Judaism, it was not strictly the law, but it was a common thing for them to be washed. And so never was a Jew told to be baptized. That was not part of the Old Testament law. And so John is, is proclaiming something new. He's saying something new. You need to be baptized for the remission of sins. It is a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And what's the word repent mean? Isn't that a good Bible word? To repent is essentially to change the mind. You look in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, repentance is used not in the sense of a step into salvation. He's talking to already those who are Christians. Uh, to, to the church there, he's saying, you know what, that godly sorrow leads to repentance, not to be regretted. There's a different type of sorrow. It's the sorrow of the world, and it's unproductive. It produces nothing. And so we talk about repentance being a change of life brought about by godly sorrow. Here's a person who says, I am not right with God. It's not his fault. It's my responsibility. I can't pass that off on anyone else. My sorrow for my sins leads me to, to think about, I need to change. I need to get my life now in line with what God wants me to do. And so John is saying, essentially, you need to reform your life. And then he, he weds that, he couples that with baptism and talks about it being for the remission of sin. So remission is a putting or a sending away. Now, for a lot of you, this is very simple stuff. These, these are concepts you've heard all of your life, but could be some watching that uh, this is kind of new territory. And so think about the repentance and remission of sins, baptism being a, a part of that. Does that sound like Acts 2, 37 and 38 when the first gospel sermon was preached? Indeed it does. The Great Commission, as Jesus gives it in Matthew 28, and Mark 16, Luke 24, you see those elements. Uh, here, belief is not mentioned. I think it's implied. These people understood who God was. Uh, but thinking about the, the Great Commission, you, you look at the, the elements, the concepts of belief and repentance and baptism. You have a, a confession thrown in there for good measure as well. And so uh, what's the, the similarity? What's the difference in between them? I would say this. 
when John the Baptist is initially preaching this, by the way, Jesus hasn't even appeared on the scene. When he's telling people to repent, he needed to. Old Testament Israel was told to repent when they were guilty of idolatry and, and moral sins and things like that. We as Christians still repent when we're guilty of things such as just that. But it's a repentance of, uh, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Jesus' blood had not been shed yet. They were still under the system. Their Judaism is still in effect. And so the blood of bulls and goats was what God had instituted for the taking away of sins. And so I would say this. John's teaching, his ministry, his his performance of even baptism was preparatory. It was looking forward to the perfect fulfillment of Jesus. Now, did people who heard that, did they stop uh, observing the Sabbath and, and giving uh, animal sacrifices? I don't think they did. And so it's for a short time, it's almost as if they are starting to abide by the new principles and new commandments that are going to be fully expounded and fully enacted when Jesus sheds his own blood. And so it was a, a, a needed thing. In fact, someone says, what if a person didn't want to be baptized back during John's baptism? Could they just kind of take it or leave it since the church is going to be established? One of the verses that kind of um, shed some light on that, if I can take you, it's not too far over. We'll get there here in about a year, maybe at our rate. Uh, it's in Luke 7, 29 and 30. Uh, let's see, here we are. It says, when all the people heard him, that's uh, Jesus, says even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John, but, watch this, the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. They rejected the will of God, not just John's opinion or something like that. And so here's an indication that for the ones who heard it, I'm not saying that all did. This was an obligation on them to, uh, to heed the, the fact that he was truly God's spokesman. All right, and so what I'm saying is John's baptism. What if, a, what if Jesus' blood had never been shed? Now, that's a question. The, the easiest answer to that is it was. God in his providence saw fit that it had to be. And so it was still looking toward the perfect fulfillment. I wouldn't baptize someone today in, in the baptism of John. I would need them to understand. In fact, the book of Acts, when you look in chapters 18 and 19, here's some case studies for one's uh, at different levels, seemingly, who heard about John's baptism, some of them after the church began, and, and when they realized it was an insufficient baptism, then resorted to the true baptism, the, the only one in effect at that time. I hope I haven't hopelessly confused you uh, through some of that. I just want to help our clarity in thinking through some of these things. Let's get a little further into our study here. Where do we leave off? Uh, it would have been Luke uh, 3. Let's take up in verse 7. It says, then, the multitudes, or then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers. Wait a minute. Brood of vipers? What if we had a guest speaker and uh, no one really had heard him before and he gets up and we're thinking, well, kind of pleasantries or maybe he's going to tell a joke. And the first thing out of his mouth is, Brood of vipers, you sons of snakes. What kind of uh, an appeal is that going to have? People going to ride him out of town on a rail? Brood of vipers, he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to save yourselves. We have Abraham as our father. I say to you that God is able to raise up children to, uh, to Abraham from these stones. It's almost like, did he wake up on the wrong side of the bed? I'm going to say that John, while it's not very, uh, or maybe it's uncouth to us, this was a very direct approach. And John knew his audience. Some of them maybe weren't really uh, sincere. Perhaps he's addressing the fringe they came to kind of, uh, maybe you could even see the smirks on their faces. They're looking at the way he's dressed and this this backwoodsy uh, type preacher and kind of uh, mocking him. Maybe he's getting right with the ones 
uh, that, uh, that needed a dose of humility there. And so thinking about how he said what he said, there were those that literally needed that wake-up call. Uh, you think about being out in the wilderness, there likely were snakes around. And even when he referenced the stones there, there's a little play on words. We don't see it in our English versions. Uh, I'll, I'll try to say it. Maybe I'm not pronouncing these words exactly right. But the word is stones that he uses and the word children. And so stones would be a banum and children would be banum. Maybe there's that little subtle play on words. God is able to raise up from these abanum those who are his banum, his children. You know, there were the ones, and we can't, we can't relate to just how much stock the average Jew back then placed on, on Abraham. I mean, he was the guy. He was the man. And so when John the Baptist says, you can't think that just because you can trace your lineage back to Abraham that you're good with God. He says there needs to be a radical shakeup in your life and even your understanding of what it is to be God's messenger. And so uh, that's going to be a startling thing there. Don't begin to say Abraham is our father. No, God can bring or raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And then he talks about the axe being laid to the root. Uh, see that there in verse 9, Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruits cut down, thrown in the fire. Jesus is later going to take up terminology like that. In fact, several times throughout the Gospels you see it. It's the idea basically of it's one or the other. It's the binary thing. It's not a matter of many different ways are acceptable. It's one or the other. Am, am I good fruit or bad fruit? And then he talks about fire. Look how many times he uses that. The people ask him in verse 10, saying, what shall we do then? What shall we do? That's similar to what uh, folks on day of Pentecost asked the crowd who had just heard a sermon then about them crucifying the Son of God. Men then, brethren, what shall we do? They were conscience smitten. They were cut to the heart. If you read uh, there in Acts 2, about verse 36, here these people hear him saying that, that you're a brood of vipers and Abraham's going to do you no good if you think uh, that lineage is what it's all about. He answered and said to them, here's the general thing, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. I think it's interesting that there is a social order and a social obligation given. He's talking to relatively poor people back then and says, you know what, you need to give half of your goods away to, to people who have nothing. He's not saying uh, that you ought to foster a dependence and that you're giving uh, people who aren't willing to work for it, but he says if you have something, share with others. Was that in the Old Testament? Sure it was. Is it in the New? Yes. And so he's addressing to me not hypothetical things, but things as they were in that day and time. In a couple of more minutes, we'll find a stopping place. But let me let me get to uh, another demographic, one of the questions there uh, that I teased you with before we started. He answered and said to them uh, the, about the tunics and about the food, but in verse 12, the tax collectors also came to be baptized. Does your version have the word publicans there? That's the old King James reference. A publican wasn't a republican but a tax collector. These often work with the Roman government. Many of them would have been Jews hated by their own people because not only did they collect the taxes, they were notorious for padding that. They would take more and people basically didn't have a lot of recourse. Uh, were kind of powerless to, uh, uh, to respond to them or, or, or to make it right. They, they just basically had to go in uh, lest they be arrested or something. And so tax collectors, teacher, what shall we do? I don't think they were shocked at all that he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. Isn't it interesting that one of the apostles Jesus chose was a tax collector by the name of who? Matthew. Matthew, Levi's his other name there. And so he's one that perhaps had done that, but he's a changed man, Zacchaeus is a great example of one who has changed. And tax collectors then, here's another demographic, the soldiers ask him saying, what shall we do? I think they're asking uh, 
because they want to know. They're not asking hypothetically. They're, they're wanting to, they're convinced they need to make a change in life. Here's what he says to them. Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. And so he's giving them very specific things about unique challenges that would apply to their occupation. I think that's great. I think that's a powerful thing. We, there's, a, there's a need for generality. Sometimes we need to hit the nail on the head. Here's exactly what you're doing or what many in that profession might be doing. And so uh, we'll kind of leave it there. Verse 15 is where we'll take up next Sunday night, Lord willing. There's an expectation on the part of the people. There's actually an assumption about John and his identity that's a mistaken one. He's going to correct that. They actually think he's the Christ. He's going to say, no, no, but he's coming. He's close. Get ready for him. I appreciate your study. I hope something has either spurred interest, make you want to dig deeper, to go back and uh, maybe one of those verses we glossed over too quickly and re-study that. Hope it's want to make you live close to God and think about our need to be right with Him uh, at all times. God bless you. Look forward to studying with you next time. Have a good, good rest of your day and week. God bless.